Right, greetings. Hello. It's uh, Dr. Thomas Daffern um, for my weekly Sunday fasting talk. And today is uh, Sunday, the uh, August the 22nd, I believe. So here I am in Beitet, as usual, in my uh, International Peace Museum. And today I'm in the Muse Clio. So, you know, this is set up as a museum of the muses, and each room is a different muse. And this one is Cleo, who is the muse of history and education. And therefore my talk today will address what historians can do, what educators can do to improve the problems of the planet, really, and how we can work together more effectively. Um, Cleo is a well-known muse, actually. She's invoked by historians. When I did my history degree at the University of London, you know, I discovered there are journals called Clio. There are historians have written about Clio as a sort of archetype, a muse for history. And this goes right back to the times of Herodotus, who's known as the father of founder of history, who wrote the histories in Greece. And uh, I studied them for A-level when I did my ancient history A-level in Brighton. And I, I've always been in love with history. There's never, time, never a time when I've not loved history. When I was young, I wanted to be an archaeologist. Um, and a historian, I guess. So, um, <clears throat> I obviously discovered also philosophy and poetry, and so, you know, I wanted to do all three simultaneously, and then art and music, and, um, but history is one of my core fundamental abiding loves, and I'm going to share some of that passion with you today, I hope. What Herodotus meant by history is simply to inquire. It's a Greek word that means to look deeply into something. He wrote his histories to try and explain the terrible catastrophic wars between Persia and Greece that had happened in his lifetime. Thousands of people had died, there had been huge, you know, bloodshed, and he wanted to say, well, why? Why has this war happened? So right from the very beginning, history had an ironic purpose. It was part of a discussion, an inquiry into why, we, why wars happen. Now... And how we can prevent them. The logical corollary is that all historians, true historians, should be working for peace. I've always taken that view, and I still do. Um, and so that's why in the 1980s I set up a group of historians for peace. I worked with people like E.P. Thompson and other historians who were trying to get... Um, there was a banner that E.P. Thompson used to walk around at peace marches saying, Historians demand a continuing supply of history. You know, it's a good it's a good thing because obviously nuclear war would destroy all of history. History would come to a full stop. We're all we're all dead basically. Nuclear on the side, as my friend um, Professor John Somerville used to say. So I was also active with philosophers for peace and the prevention of nuclear on the side. I still am. But history, I think, is the methodology we should adopt now. <clears throat> In my writings and my studies over many years into history, I then went and independently and studied the history of world religions and philosophies in Canada. Then I studied um, modern history in London University and did a degree in history. Um, and I studied and did lectures at the London School of Economics, Department of International History, at the School of Slavonic and East European Studies, where I specialised in Russian and Balkan and East European history in detail. Um, and read, did papers on all that. I did the history of European political ideas, right from the ancient Greeks to, like, down to contemporary times, in depth. And um, I also did um, papers on Russian history, and so on. You know, this this was my... And I also did an extra course, uh, on top of everything else, at SOAS, on world history since 1900, which was... Like the history of <clears throat> the 60s, decolonialism, um, etc. And then I, then I did <clears throat> specialised historical studies on, on post-war history from 45 to 2001. Looking at that Cold War period and the search for peace. I mean, I, I always felt historians should work for peace, not, not sort of rent a pen to the, the military state that you happen to be living in, to, to write justificatory treaties why your culture is better than others and why, <clears throat> you know, our country deserves to rule the world. <clears throat> no, I think historians work for the Republic of Letters 
which is the universal intelligence of mankind. I don't care if you're French, Brazilian, German, Greek, Chinese, Scottish, English. We're all part of this universal republic of letters, and true historians should therefore try and tell history in a way that <clears throat> resolves the conflicts, that, that, that explains the misfortunes and mistakes of the past, so that we don't have to keep repeating them. Obviously, I studied Marxist history in some depth. I mean, I, you know, this, I mean, Eva Thompson was a sort of kind of Marxist historian who wrote the history of the working class in, in England. And um, my mother was a, a, a kind of Marxist uh, scholar. And so I, I learned to respect the detailed work that Marxist historians have done on political and economic and, and, and class and social history. And in France, you know, there, there's an awful lot of that work. <clears throat> where I now live. And I discovered since moving to France that a lot of Marx's thinking was actually generated by his exposure to French culture. He was a Francophile and his daughters all married Frenchmen. He, he loved France. He came here as often as he could. Um, he, you, you know, idealized the, the Paris Commune, which was the kind of a, attempt to get a, you know, Republic of Equals in France again. He thought the French Revolution was really absolutely brilliant. It was the working class people standing up against corruption and injustice. And he took to heart the French ideals of liberty, equality and fraternity. I think his method was short, short changed. I think that he left out, notwithstanding his brilliant intellect, he left out the role of spirit in history. And in my critique of... of <clears throat> Well, in my search for a peace history of, of 1945 to 2001 and, and the ever, ever ongoing religious wars that are besieging mankind like Palestine, Israel, still unresolved, the Gulf War, all these wars that keep breaking out, not to mention Korea and Vietnam, <laughs> and the ongoing wars in Ireland during that time, etc., etc. I felt we need to upgrade traditional Marxist historiography and, and bring in bring back Geist. Bring back in the spirit, which he had exiled. He said, no, 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 spirit doesn't exist. God doesn't exist. We don't need it. He was sunk into this French materialism, which I think is slightly adolescent. I, I've come to the view, I share the view of the Galileo Commission, of which I'm a member, that, that no, science itself has now moved on. 19th century materialism, fine. Kant, French materialists, yeah, you could get away with that billiard ball model of history. But but I think 20, 20th and above all 21st century historians need to factor in the psychology of history. Human beings are not just our physical bodies. I'm not talking to you just as a physical body. I'm a mind in operation. I'm a soul beyond that. And I'm a spirit, you know, speaking through my mind to yours. And... And that is the subtle dimension of history that, that often Marxist or materialist histories leave out. So, no, we need a new methodology. So what, how are we going to find that? Where are we going to find that? Well, I suggested in my thesis that we should look to the history of transpersonal psychology and we should look at the, <coughs> the great thinkers of transpersonal psychology in the last hundred years or so and, and sooner. Um and see what they've been saying. So, before I go into that, let me just introduce you to a couple of books here. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this, this is one of my Bibles. It's called the Blackwell Dictionary of Historians. Um, and I've had this book for ages. I, you know, you can look up who was who in, in, among great historians. At one point, I set out to produce, you know, a, a sort of dictionary of the philosophy of history. Um, and I've got it all in notes. And um, so I was influenced by Toynbee, one of the greatest historians of the British tradition, who uh, inspired me. He was a lecturer in history at the London School of Economics and at King's College, and he, he tried to look at World War I from all sides, like the Greek side and the Turkish side. He, he, he knew that Turks were committing atrocities and so on, but then he said, well, OK, but so are the Greeks. And for this, he was hounded out of his chair at uh, King's College, which was funded by Greeks. And because he was willing to look at all sides of the, of, of the argument, they attacked him. Which is, you know, the problem historians have. Because, <clears throat> you know, to be officially paid as a historian, 
you, you have to work for someone and normally academia is in hock to some nation or some ideology or some tradition and so anyway he, he didn't suffer too much he became research director at Chatham House or the um, Royal Institute of International Affairs in St James Square which I know well and colleagues of mine have worked there and <clears throat> he he then also edited over his the rest of his life a huge collection of works a study in history and these have inspired me I have um, the historical atlas and gazetteer of this amazing book by Toynbee which has detailed maps of all the different phases and, and epochs of history and all the regions in the world he he did something epic he tried to <clears throat> you know here's the Hittite and Minoan worlds I mean, this, this is obscure stuff, which I love, because I've looked into all world history, right from the beginning of mankind's first traces in the anthropological record down to you know, contemporary times. <clears throat> and Toynbee I recognised as a, as a fellow spirit. I never met him, but, um, <clears throat> you know, he, he's cast a long shadow over anyone that's interested in world history, such as me. And so... Um, he was an inspiration for me and he was also a peace historian because he felt that why did he bother to write this huge study of history well he wanted to find out what, what's going on behind history what are the laws behind history how can we crack the code so that we can intervene in the present <clears throat> in a way that will make the future better I mean historians can't rewrite history but we can by studying history, we can then know where to put pressure in the present because we've judged from the, our study of the past. So we can then understand how we might be able to co-create a better future. That's the point of studying history. Another great historian come philosopher who influenced me is um, Benedetto Croce, <clears throat> an Italian <clears throat> historian, probably the greatest you know, 20th century Italian intellectual. Um, who was also a philosopher. He lived from 1866 to 1952. He wrote a four-volume book, The Philosophy of Spirit, 1902 to 1915. Um, you know, his philosophy was quite similar to mine, really. He also wrote a huge study of the theory and history of historiography. Like me, he was interested in how historians do their work. And he came up with this wonderful phrase, um, all history is contemporary history. Okay, what did he mean? Well, he meant that um, we can only reimagine past actions and deeds in the present. Our consciousness is rooted in the present, even though we can visit the past through writings, texts, televisions, you know, things from the past, old films, whatever, or memories. But we can only reconstruct those ever in the present. Um, so, so history is always in the now. <clears throat> um, and that means we bring to it always the tensions, competing interests of the present. So if you're looking at, you know, if I go and say, well, what's the history of Italy? And I ask some, I don't know, communist activist in, in La Creuse, and we have them. There's a strong left-wing tradition in La Creuse. I go and ask a member of the French Communist Party, what's the history of Italy? Well, they'll start reciting Gramsci and the Italian working class movement and the heroic struggle for survival, how they defeated Mussolini, uh, how they're gradually, you know, uh, gaining power on the left. Okay, so I'll get a whole narrative of, of history, which will be, actually, it won't be history at all, it'll be their contemporary narrative of what is history. If I go and ask a Green in the European Parliament, <clears throat> or a Green in Scotland, who've just taken share in government. I go and ask a Scottish Green, Patrick, the leader of the Green Party in Scotland. I greatly admire them. I'm glad they've got power now, sharing with the SNP. And I hope they get independence, because they deserve it. Um, so I go and ask my Green friend, I say, well, OK, so what's the history of Scotland? And Patrick will say, well, it's the history of, you know, the Industrial Revolution, the becoming part of the British state, building up, um, helping build up colonies, the empire, Glasgow, you know, tobacco, slavery, and uh, all that. But also good things. It was it was the Scottish Enlightenment. Um, and But the trouble was, of course, it was hyper-industrialism, and it brought, you know, desolation to inner-city dwellers and um, 
<clears throat> and etc etc and eventually we realised that the most important thing is to preserve the environment and that we should um, find a sustainable future for the economy of Scotland that we should um, find ways to generate alternative energy that don't depend on carbon release and that we should find ways to find social justice for the people of Scotland, everyone that lives here, uh, whatever your colour or race or whatever, um, you know, and we should eventually rejoin the European Union, which, which the Green Party has pledged to, and we should be part of that trans-European experiment in equality, liberty and fraternity, actually, which is what it is. Um, and we should turn our back on this ridiculous Tory a mafia that have taken and seized control of the British state and are doing unspeakable things in its name. Uh, racist, xenophobic, ignorant things. I mean, the Eton elites um, have commandeered sort of lackeys to work with them, like Pretty Patel, but they're not. They don't represent the real soul of Britain, these people. They're like renter mob types, Nigel Farage and his renter mobs. So <clears throat> the Greens of Scotland would say, Patrick would say, Enough of that. We, we, we are the authentic voice of the Scottish struggle for liberty, equality and fraternity, which has to now include all of nature, especially in this time of huge global warming and forest fires. And like either we're going down, guys, or we're going green. OK, so I'd listen to all that. And of course, that'd be true. But that's all contemporary history. <clears throat> that's Patrick, you know, projecting the, through the lens of his contemporary consciousness the values and, and evolution of the past. You know, I share... So, <clears throat> if I come along and ask, well, what is real history then, in the, in the now? If I ask Croce, well, it's the aggregate of all people's memories, reflections, and dreams, as Jung called it. Um, it's, it's the collective consciousness <clears throat> of all of us in the present, as we reflect on the past... And then as we, having reflected on the past, we then come back to reflect again on the present and steer it in a direction that we hope will bring about a better future for us all. That's why history is so important, and that's why the history of peace is so important. Okay, <clears throat> so let me introduce you to um, a couple of other books. So this is... A wonderful dictionary of world history, which I've had for years. Um, and I'm a world historian, you know. I've studied the history of Russia, China, the Tsarist phase, the the, um, the earliest Christianization of Russia, the early Slavic history, Novgorod and so on. I've I, I did that at university as well. I've studied the whole Balkan history from, like, Neolithic, what Jim Butas called Old Europe. You know, this fascinates me. Who were these people that built these first civilizations with little goddess statues? How did they transmit history? Was it, you know, they didn't have writing, although there is a script that is sort of semi being translated. But history as writing didn't start till 3000 BC. Um, and even then, it took a long time because the first things that were written down were king lists. Um, they weren't, and, and things like the books in the Bible, um, you know, they were they were not history in the sense until maybe Herodotus came, the Hecateus of um, that, that same generation, that were using prose for the first time. A lot of history was written as poetry. If you go and look at the poetry of India, the Indian savants were not really interested in history. They wanted to know the history of the gods, so they wrote the Rig Veda, they wrote the Vedas. They weren't interested in the history of this or that kingdom or you know, petty princedom and so on. And even Buddha <clears throat> wasn't that interested in history. For him, history is just endless. It's the eternal, endless wheel of karma. And the point is to kind of escape from history and reach enlightenment. Um, because so much of history is about violence, and conflict and war and death and ignorance. You know, the, the history of ignorance is infinite. What we should be focusing on is the history of enlightenment and wisdom. Now, so I took, you know, I took that to heart because Buddhism is one of my key kind of spiritual homes. Um, so the history, world history absolutely fascinates me. And, you know, <clears throat> I've studied it, like, till the cows come home. Um, but we can never escape the present. 
more world history is always being created. Um, you know, and this is the problem with history, is there's too much of it. <laughs> I mean, E.P. Thompson could well say, let's, we demand a continuing supply of history, that's fine. But, um, like, there's overproduction of history. No historian can, can master all the historical manuscripts and monographs that are published or journal articles that come out every year. Um, you know, to stay a master of the game in history, you have to specialise. And so I've worked with specialist historians, but but I'm a, I'm a bit of a rebel because I think that to be a real historian, you should also be a philosopher and ask deep questions about the meaning of history. And that's why I came up with my concept of transpersonal history. Let me show you how I did that because that's kind of interesting. So this is my actual thesis. This is my doctoral thesis bound for the University of London and was examined there. And it took me like 10 years to research and 10 years to write up. It's way over the top. You, you shouldn't have to do this much work for a thesis. But I'm one of those Turian guys with a Herculean complex. Ask me to do, you know, a couple of tasks, and I'll say, bring on the 12 tasks of Hercules. I like a challenge. <clears throat> I'm a Turian. I, I have immense um, stamina and strength. And, you know, I, I, I always do extra. And this thesis grew out of the extra. So, okay, what, what is it called? Well, it's called... Um, towards a transpersonal history of the search for peace during the post-World War II era, 1945 to 2001. So I had spent years studying why there's world conflict, why are we poised on nuclear homicide, why is there Russia and American superpowers poised to destroy each other, why are there ongoing wars in you know, I remember the Vietnam War, I was a little boy, but my family were peace activists, so we used to go on CND marches, and um, <clears throat> I remember watching when Kennedy was assassinated, the news bulletins, and feeling the horror of, here was a president trying to bring peace, trying to make peace feelers with the Russians, and he was assassinated from his own side. Obviously, it was an internal coup in America which has still not been fully explained, although there are historians that try and explain it. But I think this is one of the problems I didn't realise when I started out as a naive little junior Toynbee trying to find out the meaning of all world history. What I didn't factor in was that much of history is, is secret. Um, it dep and finding out truth depends on what which archives you've got access to, what's your security clearance. You know, it's a, it's a politicised... Um, as they now say in the jargon, weaponized field of knowledge. I didn't realize that. I thought history was just, I thought the craft of the historians is just to find the truth and objectively, and, and you go to a good library and you research it and you find out the truth and then you publish it and hey, you're a historian. That's what I did with my thesis. What I didn't realize is that knowledge is so politicized and weaponized that what may be the truth is going to be always attacked and denied by someone else. And you can spend years studying history and writing and publishing, and somebody somewhere is going to attack you and criticise you and say, no, that's not the truth. Here, this is the truth. So it's a, it's a weaponized business. I still believe in the actual concept of truth. And I did put at the forward of my thesis um, a quote from um, actually Hermann Hesse, who, although he's not a historian, is a... Um, you know, it was a genius, I think. And um, <clears throat> let me see if I can find the actual quote, because it's such a good quote. Um, hmm. Come on. Sorry about this. Ah. Right. Um, <clears throat> I can't find it, but the it's a quote from Hermann Hesse. I can't remember where I put it. Ah, oh, maybe it's at the front of the history paragraph um, chapter. Bear with me a second. I think I remember where it is now. So it's on page 18, right. Right, this is the quote. It's from Magister Ludi, Herman Hesse's great book called The, um, you know, um, the, the, the Game Master, Magister Ludi. To study history... One must know in advance that one is attempting some, something fundamentally impossible. 
yet necessary and highly important. To study seriously means submitting to chaos and nevertheless retaining faith in order and meaning. It is a very serious task and possibly a tragic one. So that's the quote I put at the chapter on history. <clears throat> and I looked at the history of historiography from 1945 to 2001. And I asked, during that time period, which historians have been asking what is peace and how can we study the history of peace? And I obviously looked at people like Toynbee and Britain and Peter van den Dungen, who's a colleague of mine, who was probably the greatest peace historian of Britain, who was professor for many years at Bradford University, Peace Studies Department. And, um, <clears throat> you know, he's been promoting peace history. I worked with people in the International Peace Research Association who were historians, and who, there is a small but active group of peace historians on the planet. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, everyone does their bit to try and extend this idea. Then I looked at what was going on in Russia among peace historians. Is there a peace historical tradition in Russian history? And yes, there kind of is, but it was very politicized. Um, and then what about in the USA? Is there a peace history tradition in the USA? Yes, there is. I discovered it. I corresponded with them, people like Charles Chatfield and, you know, many others. There's an official historian appointed by Congress who's like the official historian of the USA. And, and I corresponded with them and... Then I joined the American Historical Association. This is their Guide to Historical Literature, which is a list of all the periodicals, books that they recommend for each region and epoch in history. And history is loved in America and in Russia um, <clears throat> and in every country in the world. But the trouble is governments do try to control history. They like to alter the narrative. And, and so st in the era of Stalinism, during the Cold War, which is, you know, in my time frame, Stalin absolutely tried to crack down on independent historians and say, no, 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 stick to the party line, which was pure materialism, and you couldn't deviate from that, or you might be risking getting shot and or taken off to a camp somewhere. I mean, those are scary times, <clears throat> and I don't think that, you know, intellectuals should ever be persecuted and so on like that as long as they're not advocating something crazy you know um, violence and so on I mean I'm a man of non-violence a Gandhian I believe that history should be conducted in a spirit of free inquiry non-violence and the search for truth and I'm with Gandhi on that um, <clears throat> Nehru is another kindred spirit of mine because in the Indian historical tradition when Nehru was locked up in jail, as he often was for his resistance to the British non-violently, one time he took time aside and he wrote a history of the world. You know, I love Nehru. He's such a kindred spirit. And I've been to his museum in Delhi where he lived. It's now a museum, his study. And he was a great thinker, old Nehru. You know, he was a historian as well as a legal thinker and a politician. And he cared deeply about the history of India. That's why he loved Ashoka, because India is so rich in in the history of peace. They have given birth to Buddhism, one of the great world religions for peace. They've given birth to um, the Ahimsa traditions of Jainism, who I know well. And they've given birth to the Hindu concepts of, of enlightenment, and the core thing in history is to find enlightenment, samadhi. And they also gave birth to Sikhism, which was another sort of peace movement attempt between Muslims and Hindus to make peace. And then to Gandhi and the whole non-violence tradition, which carries on into the modern world. That's why I'm trying to help the Universal Peace Tower be built in southern India. So, <coughs> you know, history in India is, is the unfurling of peace. But also in Europe. So I looked at historians active in, in Germany, in in all over France, Britain, Spain, you know, where are the historians? Okay, that was that chapter. And then I looked at, um, I did similar treatment to um, philosophers. I asked, okay, so that's what historians are doing for peace. Uh, what are philosophers doing? And again, I, I wrote up the history of philosophers in internationally, in the Soviet Union, in um, America, in Britain, in Russia, in Russia, in Europe, and different 
cultures and India and so on. And I found, you know, there are a steady tradition of philosophers working for peace. Whilst I was doing the research, I actually got involved and I went to Moscow as a, a made coordinator of International Philosophers of Peace. And I've worked with, with a group ever since. I'm vice president. Our, our president is uh, Glenn T. Martin, who also runs the World Constitution and Parliament Association. And we're in contact and, you know, we're still doing our thing as Philosophers of Peace. But um, I wish we could do more, you know. That's why I'm trying to build the Universal Peace Tower. Then we'll have a base to do the more. Then I looked into religion and the search for peace. And I asked, what are the religions doing? Where are the religious thinkers, theologians, during this time period? What have they said about peace? Anything useful? And of course they have. There have been all the great peace campaigners, the Martin Luther Kings, starting off with Gandhi, and then you know, a continuing supply of radical theologians in the Christian tradition, um, and the Hindu and the Buddhists and the Jain and the uh, Islamic to some extent, but maybe one would have liked slightly more Muslims to be active in the non-violence traditions. Um, and I've talked about you know these problems. And then finally I ended up with the fifth chapter looking at the psychological sciences and the search for peace, which is psychologists during this time frame have been actively campaigning for peace. And what have they said? What have they said about the psychology of human nature? Why do we go for war and violence? What is it about human nature that makes us so aggressive, competitive, disrespectful, argumentative, and so on? Well, you know, psychologists have worked out kind of what's going on. And in a nutshell, it's a lack of higher gnosis, a lack of higher knowledge of your higher self. You get chasing demons in the soul. You, you get inflated with ego obsessions. You know, you have to do it my way. You have to have me, me, me win, you know. And that sort of ego stuff is ego psychology, which Freud, Melanie Klein analysed. Um, to transcend that, you have to go to transpersonal psychology. You have to listen to Jung. You have to open your Ken Wilber. You have to open your Maslow and your Asagioli. And you have to look at the history of transpersonal thought. So what I said at the end, the concluding chapter is, Okay, so let's let's develop a transpersonal historiography. Let's develop a history that <clears throat> isn't about the history of people's egos or the history of ignorance or the history of wars. We've got that. That's endless. As Buddha said, you know, ignorance is infinite. Um, no, let's begin a history that looks at the higher thought of people. Let's look at the history of great sages and thinkers like Alan Watts or Sorokin or... Um, Don B. Griffiths or, you know, all the great intellectuals of our time that have thought about peace and tried to promote it. What, are th what is their secret? How have they accessed the transpersonal? How did Toynbee? You know, um, and, and so transpersonal history tells the good news of history. It talks about the saints and sages of each succeeding epoch. In every epoch on, on, in human history, there have always been a few realised souls. Sometimes quite a few, like in Chang Dynasty in China, China the Tang Dynasty, um, you know, it was quite an enlightened place. The same in, in um, India around the time when Patna was the capital and Buddha was teaching. You know, there were some pretty enlightened people around. Um, <coughs> and I would say in Andalusia during the time of Cordoba, when the great libraries and scholars were active and they were all translating each other's texts from Islamic, Christian and Jewish sources. And savants were going off and becoming multilingual. That was another golden age, intellectually. Or Baghdad, before the Mongols hit, when the House of Wisdom was active and sages were translating books from you know, Indian sources on mathematics and astronomy and translating them to Arabic. They were translating Greek works into Arabic. And it was, it was one big happy family of wisdom seekers. Now that's transpersonal history, okay, that's the point of what I'm proposing. And what I'm saying in the thesis is we're not going to get peace on earth till we start doing that, collaboratively and collectively.